All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now in this episode, I chat with the stage and screen actor, Judith Roberts, about silent films, theater, David Lynch, Dead Silence, James Wan, Mary Shaw, method acting, and more. As always, thank you for listening, and if you'd like to help the show grow, please leave us a review wherever you're listening to the podcast. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. Beware the stare of Mary Shaw. She had no children, only dolls. And if you see her in your dreams, be sure you never, ever scream. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Just so we have a platform to jump from here, Judith, take us back in time to when you were a youngster. <laughs> were you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all of the above? I was sort of shot, and there's nothing like somebody saying to you, you know, well, I wanted to be an opera singer when I was very young. I thought that, and I studied music for a while. And then, but then, you know, there's nothing like saying if you're shy, well, don't you want to do a few lines from something? Don't you want to do something? For it makes you feel, oh boy, there's an excuse. If you're doing it aligns for somebody, then that's okay. Right. So it makes you get out in the world, right? the 60s, 60s, late 60s, the, the European element that came, came here from De Sica to oh, all of those people. I would say they were the formative ones. When, when I was very young, it was pretty, you know, Bambi, you know, I mean, whatever <laughs> it had been. <laughs> it wasn't, I mean, that early on. This was early on when I was still at home and when the early films that came over from Europe, from wherever it was, England, Italy, all of it, it just turned me around. I didn't, it made you think, well, there's, it wasn't that there weren't formative films here, but there was something about that, that world that that really made me feel that it's pretty gorgeous. Just mentioning a few of those names were, you know, from Fellini to all the obvious, uh, not obvious, but obvious now in a sense of history it made me feel it just made me feel outside myself and like the world was kind of opening up in a way to something other than here which Mm. i'm not oh god there were gorgeous films i remember seeing well not when i was too young but some like it hot way back when it first came out you can't beat that film i've never seen the stage thing or anything like that have you i haven't i I haven't no I, no, I haven't either. It's sort of like it, <laughs> it, in a way, is a perfect, perfect example. He was pretty amazing. There were many American filmmakers that were also interesting, but for some reason, that European invasion here at that time made me feel. Now, whereabouts yeah. did you grow up, Judith? Boston, outside of Boston. Outside little, of Boston. A little town during the Second World War, because my, I'm 88 now, so it, it is, and I don't mind telling my age, because after a certain amount of time, it doesn't seem to matter anymore, <laughs> <laughs> if that makes sense. So, they grew up in a place called Watertown, Massachusetts, and its claim to fame was a, um, I think, a huge, huge buildings that were for this for the second world war armaments and things like that i remember that Mm. because we engaged for a reason then or seemed to if any war is a reason that's what i remember i remember Mm -hmm. victory gardens which my father had they would give away land during the war the second world war and people would grow because they wanted people to grow their own food 
I mean, not that we didn't have, we had rationing and all of that, but we didn't have, we, so there was still food available, but nothing like the horrors of today's in that, in that sense at all. But I remember my father at his victory garden. So that was that town. I can't remember the town too favor, favorably for, you know, let's say, acting or any of the arts per se at that right. time. But I'm sure there were for some, but it, anyway, it took a while, but I did want to become an opera singer for a while. And I sang for a while, and I, I still sang for a little bit later on, but it, so that was my beginning. I was glad to leave it. So, <laughs> <laughs> What year did you leave? Oh, well, it was, you know, I went through high school and into, I left about age, because I stayed on a little after that. It was like um, 19, 20, you know, gotcha. something like that. And got a small job in a tent circus, you know, and did some singing, acting, and the, stayed with that. And then slowly that year, I got other jobs and did that and, and went to school. Well, I was also going to school at that time in terms of singing, in terms of acting and then on into that's when i moved out and moved to new york at that time that's some other jobs sending me around the country a little bit doing that mainly theater in the beginning it was shows i would get i went to california on a job and then i stayed out there got married for a while was did did some stuff out there that's where i did a racer head like mm. this was much later but for that time it was mainly moving around doing different theater jobs different singing try, doing some singing doing some a few film things then that was in the uh, well late late 59 60 61 62 before you were born <laughs> <laughs> and uh, mainly back and forth, I'd come back to New York, and then I went out and lived in California for a little bit then. I lived there for, let's see, yeah, the, in the 60s, I was out there. When you were sure. in high school, were you, yeah. were you involved in theater then? Were you just starting on stage then? Well, I think because of part of the personality issues of of either being not being if somebody would ask me to do yes I, I was involved in the sense that i went to school at boston university for a while studied acting with some people who are long since gone and it but was dealing with studying then more than actually doing stuff in my high school years i did did a little bit, yes, a little bit, some singing, a little, but actually it was later that things started to happen, or I was willing to, I started to grow up mm. and, get, <laughs> and sort of take things, take things over a little bit. But it was different then, you know, in the late 50s and 60s, a woman in the theater and the, in all of that world was a, diff, a little different, less demanding, less, less all of those things that have happened and rightfully so in this day and age in a crazy way sometimes. But here we are. <laughs> here we are. Here I am still <laughs> learning, you know. <laughs> I was glad to leave that area. You never can blame an area for where you live. For the past, it has all to do with one's own creation in time of what one is. Were your parents artistically inclined at all? Did you well, get some Well, my mother could sing. She sang really well. She sang well. She was a little bit athletic, and she was. But certainly, the past that she came from, which was pre World War II, which was the Depression, which was an enormous that first Depression, not the recent one. But I mean, it it was quite different for her. She didn't pursue that much. And my father. They both came from Maine. Maybe that tells you something. <laughs> and in May, where are you from? By I'm the from way? South Carolina. South Carolina, mm -hmm. okay. Well, I've been to South Carolina, beautiful state, but Maine has a kind of really stoic. They say things, that, you know, like, yep, yep, you can do it, yes. Very Stephen it. King. <laughs> very St yes, yes, very Stephen King, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I know. 
I mean, the few times I went to Bain, I wish I had gone more. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a kind of incredible state. Beautiful, beautiful. And well, Massachusetts is too, it, it, but it, it was different. That's all I can say. <laughs> are, you living, are you still living in Massachusetts? Am I still living? No, I live here in New York City on 43rd Street in Hell's Kitchen, what is oh, called. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hell's Kitchen was, it's previous, that, that term came to be used a lot for this area, 43rd Street and 9th Avenue. And the building I live in now, or well, have for the last, what has it been, over 30 years? I think so. It's a performing arts building, I should say. Not everybody. They had to incorporate the people from the area when they built these buildings. They decided, since the building wasn't, because it was really Hell's Kitchen then, and it still is, Emma. it's kind of great. It's kind of great, <laughs> not so great. New York is that. Have you ever lived here? I've never lived in New York. I've never visited. You've never visited? Never visited. Oh, you will. I know. It just is, uh, yeah, you got to experience it. It's, it's the best and the worst, <laughs> you, you might say, all, all at the same time. It's for this t part of my life and for all, but it, it works the best. And right. I live in this kind of great building, which provides uh, spaces to do uh, the arts, all of that. So it's it's quite good. It's on the 44th floor. So you're on 44th Street on the 44th floor? On 43rd Street. 43rd Street, gotcha. <laughs> on the 44th floor, yes. And it uh, leads into the Hudson River. Actually, years ago when Tully went down into the river, when the plane went down and landed in the Hudson River, a friend of mine came running back to me and she said, there's a plane in the river. You're totally insane. And so I followed her out to there and I saw the end of the plane just drifting down the Hudson River. <laughs> <laughs> It was quite something. It is what was something was that all of the pleasure boats that are there all went and, and did rescue and stuff like that. So it was great. It was amazing. Do you remember your very first time on stage? Whatever you consider that to be, whether grade school or college? Oh, really? The first time? Yeah, well, huh, because they get muddled together. It was the... Oh, <laughs> the first time I walked up on a stage was when I must have been, I don't know whether it was to do something or to say a word or two or whatever it was, but it was awful. You know, oh, it no. was an awful, awful experience. It wasn't like some people who have performed since the beginning and not really, really into it. But I remember walking up on the stage and I felt like I was completely unclothed, you know. Yeah. It, it, it changed. I have to say it changed a great deal <laughs> progressively after that. But I think I was about, about 10, 11, something like that when that happened. And then slowly as I got out of the area I was in, which had a great deal to do with keeping a lid on things, is that went, got a little better. So then I started to get, you know, some parts in the city a little bit or going out of Boston area and working so that's what that did but I re always remember that and sort of feeling like oh my god and then later I realized that the, sta the stage or performing was a place to be you could get out of yourself and sort of be someone else thought so, you know it's really yourself you're doing you could get out of those fears because you had a hey I'm acting you know <laughs> So that's okay. Or somebody said it was okay. Does your approach as an actor differ depending on whether you're on stage for a role or on screen? It doesn't change internally. I will say the internal apparatus, it isn't that it's the same. Nothing ever is the same. But the internal workings in order to alleviate stuff that doesn't work for the part and to use yourself, because what else have you? You're still the person out there. You're right. not another human being from somewhere else. So it, it is, you're still who you are, but it's the part of yourself that you want to use for something. You know, there are certain physical things, or if it's a very aggressive, all of those things play into it. So you're always bringing yourself. If you can't bring, you've got to bring yourself. And that's one some of the first things you try to learn. Sometimes they're the hardest, too. Well said. Sticking on acting for a second, as a layman, I'm not an actor, but sure. we hear the term method acting thrown around a lot. 
<laughs> and yeah, what does the term method acting mean to you? And what's your method? Uh, yeah. Okay. I grew up when the method, Stanislavski, who changed his mind in his work anyway. Towards the end, he said, we got to lighten up. Anyway, the, the method was, for some people, incredibly instructive. Incredi incredibly. I had friends who, it, it did not, in the sense as it was done by Lee Strasberg, did not necessarily, at that time, work for me. It was an attack, it felt like. Mm. So you have to look at, and this is all, this is hindsight, of course. You have to look at the world. The world was, oh God, you have to take this pretend glass. It's not, nothing ever is pretend in that time that you have to lift it up and make it real and all of that. I, all of those things seem to be difficult. Now, I found Strasbourg and that studio method really difficult. Later, it was easier. I mean, not that I, I'm not sure that I believe in, it. there's all of the elements from Britain, which has some great, act, you know, all of the wonderful actors they have. You have Russian actors, you have Italian companies, you have all of this stuff. It's all worthwhile. But if you're at a certain age and fixated, on something, sometimes it can get in the way of everything. Mm. So I would say at that time in my life, in my late teens, early 20s, it was not as easy. Once in a while it would really work, then not at all. So I didn't really have a method then. So I've been searching my whole life. <laughs> I've started so, to understand it more now at 88 than, and, than I did earlier. <laughs> Because I've sort of tried to put together in my mind, what is a method? Do I have a method? What is that? And is there a difference between film and television or film and theater? On one level, I would say, no, there's no difference in terms of projection and all of those things. It's obvious. You can whisper, and even on television or film, you can't understand a word. But, you know, it is an assemblance of one's life, which is closer to what I think acting is for me. I think if I had gone on to Britain and been able to get over there and study the particular techniques for the stage and stuff, then we have them here too. You can study here at Juilliard, wherever it may be, in NYU, whatever. But yes, it probably would have put me in a direct, more direction of uh, theater. And it would have given me some more abilities in that area. So, but it's all the pay. It has to do with one's life, and one's life is an accumulation of all of these things. I can't dismiss Lee Strasberg. I can't dismiss John Gilgood, who turned into what a very wonderful film actor. Actually, he did some amazing films, and it—it's all a question of open openness to the world you're in, and picking up a bit of all of it. It sounds hmm. very general, but I—I um, I can't say, oh, I have this. This is how I work. I take a part and then I break it down and and do that. Maybe you can a little more for the theater. You know, there are certain things in theater that are prerequisites, movement, all of that stuff that you sometimes don't even have in television and film. But those are sort of technical things, and, and it, they're, they're there, and you have to be aware. But I just feel that I feel that it's such a life process. Maybe it's because I'm old now, and, and, and it, it is, that's one of those things. I don't know. Do you recall struggling with the shift yourself from going from stage to screen? Do you recall sort of internally struggling oh, with that? Oh, yeah. Certainly when I hadn't done very, very little film, I'd, there was a tendency to, I don't want to say, well, overdo or a tendency to do the things that you were kind of a little used to doing. and But as I watched, in film anyway, how little... <laughs> that is a learning process. Little you ha ca have to do. And the stuff where I can remember seeing where I didn't do little, you know, <laughs> you, know you see the gears grinding and all of that. You see all, you don't want to see that in film. 
So that is true. There is, is certainly in the beginning, there's a sense of, oh, wow, why when I look at this? Because I would examine things later. Some people don't do that, but I would examine. You know, this is way back. I've got better at that, mm. even though I can, you know. Right. <laughs> better and better. You get better. Hopefully you get better and better until you can't do it anymore. That's that's kind of what I think about that. I have a question about a specific production of a Tennessee Williams play sure. that you were involved in in the 90s, Sweet Bird of Youth. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you, you see that by any I chance? didn't. I, Bill Sage okay. is a friend and listener of the show, and he knew that you were coming on, and he was involved in that production with you. We got, how is he doing? He's way? been in several films here recently, still I, still I very know. active. He, he's still, that's wonderful. There are a few, like there was another guy that I just saw in oh, that film, Barry. Not film, a television show called yeah, Barry. Yeah, Barry. I know, the, I know the show, yeah. Henry Did Winkler. You know <laughs> yeah, oh God, that, that some of the acting is fabulous in that show. Mm -hmm. and the, the guy who does does oh, what is his name? <laughs> he plays the guy who pushes the lead character to do all his killing. He's really in the beginning. He's all strapped up. They're about to kill him, and it. His name's it, escaping me. I, I'm following you though. But you are okay. Yeah. It's, it's escaping me too. But we're talking about 40 years ago or something yeah. <laughs> when we did um, Streetcar. So. <laughs> A street partner in desire, and so he was in that. It's sort of like the same thing you're saying about Bill Sage. Mm -hmm. So it is. Um, oh, Did that production was strange. It could have been directed better. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but Bill, he was a dear, dear heart. He had nothing but great things to say about you and your performance. I mean, he really I enjoyed nothing, working. With him. I, the he is. He was so lovely, and if we'd had, I, I liked her. She was, she's a lovely lady, a great producer who did this, and but it needed, it needed some more stuff. But Bill was wonderful and so sweet. Please say hello. I to will. Me. I will. I'll, 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 I'll clip this for him and send it to him. <laughs> oh, lovely, lovely. Say hello. Say hello. Say hello. Hi, Bill. Anyway, <laughs> that was that time. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's interesting. Are you still active on stage? I'm not active on stage because what I developed was a thing called osteoporosis. That gets a little much, even though I'm now going into doing swimming things to, to help it and do that. But it, it, it limits a little, but not, not, you know, working in a very simple kind of surrounding. So it's much, it's much better and I enjoy film more. I do. When I, I just did, in my apartment, we managed to get a GoFundMe to do a project so at, on film that's uh, called The Lion, but it's just myself and wonderful director and a few other people who turned out to be really good. So we will we'll finish editing it soon. So it will come out. Will it will come out in some form? Go to festivals, things like that. Gotcha. That's what you will try for the because I've done a lot of that with another friend. This is where. I just somebody would say, hey, I've got a five-minute script. You want to do it? Sure. This is way back when, you know, just what's better way to learn or, or to get better or whatever. So I just do it. Right. There's another person who's supposedly calling to, and then another one that hasn't finished it takes forever, as you know, in film. <laughs> so it's, everything is from, no, I haven't, I'm changing this, I'm doing this. I'm blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I do love it. I love the, once you get into an ease with something, it, yeah. it just is great. So during anyway. your time on stage, Judith, do you have any personal favorite roles that you played? Maybe a handful of ones that stand out to oh, you? They're told Brett wrecked some uh, pirate jenny pirate jenny is a role from german kurt weil and berto brecht wrote several do you know of them I, i'm not familiar i'm not okay anyway they wrote these operas in the 20s 20s and 30s i love doing the, the part of pirate jenny and and we did a whole compilation of their work actually in st louis wow and it was a wonderful experience we just did it on stage and very very you know where people sit down and talk about it. it's very political it's very it's very of the time mm. Beto Brecht was one of the great 
German writers, and it, I, I loved I loved that work. Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weil, who was the composer. You will probably know many of the songs or the things in the musicals he wrote. He came here. Bertolt Brecht was pretty anti-American, so it it was. I say that because he was very left wing and mm. very on the left side of things. So he, uh, but he stayed in his own country and stood up against so much. And so did Kurt Weill and Kurt Weill and his wife, Lottie Lenya. She did all of Beto Brecht's music. They came here and she was famous in the 30s. Some of it ran a long time on Broadway. Uh, I love that. I love doing that. But look that look that up. I am. I, I wrote it down. To some of the music, because the music is wonderful. It's just so intense and funny and <laughs> a lot of things. What was your first time on Broadway, Judith? Oh, I did a. It wasn't totally memorable, but it was. It was a. It was a funny, funny part, and uh, it was in. Um, it was a um, a fun experience. It was a fun experience to do. I remember one. At one point, I bring out this little dachshund in my arms. I would. I would. She's very upper class. Very, very, very. <laughs> And so she comes out on stage, and this is her first entrance, and she comes out with the dog, with the dog, just holding the dog, with these fox, real, this was a very expensive show, the very real fox furs. So there's real fox furs that I have on, which the designer, costume designer, when we were doing it, said to me, I was touching these fox furs that she was putting on me, and she says, um, don't touch the furs. She said, oh, don't touch the furs? But she said, rich people never touch the things, the jewels of the things they have. They don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> but I know what she was saying. She yeah. was saying, you don't, prove, you, you don't need to touch because you've always got a second or third one. And that, that um, to touch it meant that you were searching for it. So don't keep checking whether you have it or playing with it. It was, <laughs> I'll always remember it was the best actually it was the best critique of that you know better than the director but it, because it said everything to me but anyway so <laughs> and then I walked out on stage with the dachshund and the dachshund is just looking up at me and then as we walked in on stage there's a little rumble in the audience and the dog does this total turn to the audience and they went just flew into laughter <laughs> because it, the dog just looks out at them like, oh, really? You know? <laughs> it was great. We've worked our way back up to a racer head. Oh, we're back up to a yeah, racer Yeah, we're back up to okay. How did that happen for you? Was it a typical audition? Oh, I was in, no, no, not at all. It was, I was in California and I knew Charlotte Stewart, the other actress who was in there who played the wife. Do you know? Mm. You know? I, I know yeah. of her role, yes. Right, exactly. She called me one day and she said, you know, there's a friend of mine who's doing this movie at AFI. And I thought you might be right for that. And so she said, you want to go over? I said, I guess so. You know, okay. You know, I didn't know him. No one knew him really outside of the beginnings of the industry. He had done a thing called Grandma, had done, you know, a couple right. of other, other other films. So, And uh, I said, okay. So I went over and we sat down, kind of stared at each other. And he said, yeah, would you like to do this? And I said, yeah. And so that's how it began. <laughs> <laughs> Because he was looking for a visual thing, obviously. Mm, yeah. And so he, um, as you know, probably made everything that was in that movie himself by hand. The fetus creature was on the table, the desk, wherever it, he was. He was there all the time. Even in close proximity, it was um, pretty weird. He was, <laughs> like Spike, as everyone called him. And most of the people who were working with David then were very close to him. And mm. then even a longer history of school, I, I don't know if it was school, or, but certainly a longer history, a closer history than I did. But it. But I remember he was so specific about costume, about what it should be. There was never any question in David's mind what he wanted. It was that kind of 
unpretentious com confidence that this was somebody I didn't totally realize it at the moment, but certainly he was very sure without being like <laughs> none of that, none of that, none of that quiet, if anything. He took his time, and then at one point he said, I don't like what I've been doing in these sections. One of them was to me. He said, I don't, don't like, so I'm going away for, not away, because he was, AFI was struggling with him all the time. <laughs> Get it done. Get it done. I'm going, we're going crazy. So he, uh, he took it away, came back, we did it again, and that was, that's what was ultimately used. I had no idea that at the time when he finished what this this going was going to become one of the great cult movies around. Right. You, never, you know, you never know that anyway. I mean, there were many films that were huge and huge even before that who were like, are you kidding? You know? <laughs> it, it, um, Casablanca, for instance, was also. I think, if my memory serves me, that it was also not thought that it would become oh my god you know it isn't that they didn't think it was good either one of these films it was a question of my god this this is amazing <laughs> point when you're working with david is it fair to say that that's the most bizarre production you were a part of up to that part of your career at that point yes 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 i did other horror films a few other you know a few others some that have been successful some that didn't get done or whatever yeah, but for some reason, I really kind of like that. <laughs> I like the off-center kind of thing because it's more fun to try to get back to, try to see what the reality in that crazy or, or quirkiness or it is in it. I just find that interesting. Now, when it comes to the horror genre specifically, were you ever a fan? Did you have any horror movies that you liked yourself? Yeah, I never really thought about you know people who say horror genre i still sort of feel like it's it's a film hmm. it's a film whether it's horror or not if there is some sense of the film i did in 2005 which was it has become sort of a dead silence and silence, mm. yeah, which is, I thought James Wan was incredibly talented. Sometimes I think in that film, is my feel, I mean, I just think some of the stuff was really amazing. But to look at, to be a part of, sometimes I think, anyway, it doesn't really matter. The, the thing is that it was fascinating. And I became, I had the first time in my life had a chance to look at the kind of work that the horror film, you might say horror, or just film industry does. Mm -hmm. I was able to see guys in a room making tongues, making, you know, all of this stuff. And I was like, I have to, have to say, they were so creative, so intense, making copies of human bodies, making some things that were never used, it seemed, in the film that I saw being made and done in that film. That was extraordinary extraordinary he was quite interesting director i couldn't watch the couple of uh, that's really hard that slasher films that were his first that, that was a little little much but he has a really incredible ability i think i think he's a very fascinating director i i just think yeah i haven't what do you know anything of his recently oh uh, yeah he just did it's a great movie uh really i'm, I'm hold on i gotta look it up it's gonna drive me nuts James Wan. Malignant. Malignant is the new film that he just released that's very, very oh, good. Really? Mm -hmm. Is it? Some people split because, you know, it's supposed to be a horror film, but halfway through, he kind of does a 180. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. he, you know, he takes his become, risk. Yeah, because I really think he's quite a talent, quite talented guy. How much did you know about uh, your character, Mary Shaw, going into that audition? Nothing other than reading this, reading the text, and the text changed, and t you know all of that. That's all I, re I remember. A lot of the experience with him and with doing it, and and especially in the auditorium with the boy and the and the response to there were there were a lot of they rented a whole theater and took it over and did it again, and they, I just or whatever they got in terms but they had a theater there and they did it and it was quite extraordinary i thought maybe that's why it has lasted as a i still get residuals or you know what I mean? <laughs> that's my personal favorite james wan movie 
Oh, really? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I just think, I, th I think it's amazing. Only thing I felt, and then I'm wondering if you feel the same way, is it showed a little bit too much. The puppet was brilliant. But Billy, but it almost as if it, it needed to be more of a, it needed to be less of stuff. And I was wondering if he was influenced by the studio or whatever. I, I yeah, don't, I know, I know what you mean. Yeah, but I think, I think, I, I just have great respect for him. I think he's so good. And I just have to tell you while I have you here, uh, just your personal performance in that movie is is excellent. I was 16 when that movie came out. And my friends and oh, I all really? went to the theaters and you scared the mess out of us. <laughs> oh, well, I I just loved the way his mind worked. And he never explained himself, you know, direct, and directors who stand around saying, this is what I plan to do and I'm going to do it. I went, oh, you know, I mean, <laughs> just tell me what you want and I'll figure it out and we'll try it two or three different ways. But it, he doesn't do it. He just says we're going to do this and this and <laughs> I just thought he was a terrific guy and he never seemed to get I'm sure he did you know anyone making a movie has to go through some form of hell right so but he was he was always quite quite level headed and smart very smart guy how much yeah. time did you put in the makeup chair for that one Oh, oh, oh my God! <laughs> Much more than it looked looked because it, though it may have, it just is. When we were experimenting with it, we got they. There were two guys, the sweetest guys, and they would. First of all, they made all of the little pieces that went on the face and all of that, and they sent them, and they changed their mind from California, and they go back and forth and back. And forth. <laughs> Sometimes you know, and they were kind of amazing. All of that, that it took five hours to do and about three, two to three hours to take off. But the days you worked was that doing it and, and it got a little, it was always smooth. They were because we did practice sessions, we did a few practice sessions on these. And the two young men who were, you know, and there were changes and so, but still they were always very level-headed and very protective and I have to say it couldn't have been better if it's not stinging or hurting and none, none of that did so suddenly once twice no not really even the skin held up very well and so it, it became sort of meditative after a while <laughs> sort of sort of <laughs> and it, at the end of the day getting it off one would wish it would be quicker but but i tell you handled beautifully so it was it was everyone was very kind oh i did wear two contact lenses and at that time i was wearing contact lenses i don't do that anymore so i was used to them so you put in one and you put in the other because they wanted a green or the blue or something i forget now that was because you couldn't see too well. So you had to be sort of led around by the hand to the next set. There was always someone there to do that. And they, that didn't feel too bad either. It was my, my eyes were used to them. It was okay because I did it once again on crazy thing called the Harchie Hauler. I don't know if you ever. I'm not familiar with that one. No, it was it was a con, not Comic Con, but it was um, Comedy Channel. These guys, great guys, who've done a lot of that stuff for for TV. This was for TV. Yeah, it was the Comedy Channel. They also did contacts in the eyes, and also did the thing that's the most difficult is putting is doing a head mask. Mm, it's mm. got to stay on about twenty minutes to harden, and then you sort of have fantasies. Is it, we're going to come off, you know. <laughs> yeah. it is, it is, that that one, I that part of it, I didn't like. But you only do that once. And I did it once for the this thing called the heart she holler. It was like a holler in America mm. and somewhere out in the south. And this insane town, insane town, with all these different people. These people who are really good. And I mean, it's a bizarre film. It was. Uh, on I have to look. I have to look that one up it's too. It's still is showing. It still is showing. As a matter of fact, here and there, I get residuals actually for that. And wow. I did a voiceover for something for him, John Lee. Well, there are probably millions of John Lees and his partner. I I don't know what's happening with them right now. But we did this for three years. Mm. This not not to holler, 
but to a hauler in the south. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Like a location, yeah. a region or something. Well, a region, yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. They did some crazy work. That was crazy, crazy. And uh, I was a thousand-year-old woman with long white hair. <laughs> I'm going to look that up, too. Yeah, we looked that up because it's funny. And it's in... Off and on, it's still playing on the Comedy Channel. Or I think it is on the Comedy Channel. I don't know. Then there was another one called The Last Thing Mary Saw. Yeah, I don't know. That's, that's, did you see that? I, I just looked it up. I have not seen it myself. Though. I'm, I'm familiar right. with it. Yeah, no. It was done, and it's got some playing time. It's been played a lot. It's be- beautifully shot. Beautifully shot. He has a really good eye, this guy. But it. I don't... It's about a alt family in the 1800s, and about there's two young girls in it who have an affair, which is a no-no, and it's a horror in the sense of what what happens in it. But it, and I'm the matriarch. That sounds like my alley. The baddie, the baddie. Yeah. <laughs> it's Judith, what is the best acting advice you've received in your career, and who gave it to you? <laughs> it wasn't advice exactly because it didn't come through any words. John Cassavetes, you know him, the director? Mm-hmm. Okay. I did a short, I think it's the film is Minnie and Moskowitz that he did, one of his many films he did in his apartment, I mean, in his home, and he did out in California, and that's when I was in California living. I think this is 1973 or four, and it's called Minnie and Moskowitz. Very, very short little bit. I mean, it's a a scene with John Cassavetes himself and his wife, but the wife isn't in it till the very end. And I think, I don't know if it's the best advice. I received advice every actor has in some form or other. And I can think of usually less is more you know, sometimes when you're off the, off the band. So that is always true. But with this tiny scene, and tiny it is, it can't be more than three, uh, five minutes, something like that. The uh, But it's just he and I, really, in the kitchen, discussing the fact that I, obviously, it's unspoken, that, I, that he is having an affair with someone else. You know, actually his wife, the actual wife. I mean, in real life. So all he did was direct through himself. I don't know how to explain it. He did very little except engage. Mm. He engaged like it was amazing, meaning it was truthful all the because he was a terrific actor himself. And so, and at one point he grabbed me and kissed me. And it was so right for that. It, it was... Uh, I'll just always remember that as some of the mo- one of the most intense moments. And as about a week later, I got a letter from both he and his wife saying, "If we could have done it, we would have added more. We would have done, you know." And it was it, why I retain that is that it was so simple and real, so simple, simple, simple and real. And I take the actual engagement in a way as saying that. We lost an incredible guy there, too, early on. And his wife was lovely, just so lovely. Always, I remember her coming up with, there was always some new child of theirs that she was carrying downstairs, and they were pretty terrific. So, Judith, uh, this is something I like to ask everyone, because you never know what they're going to say. Have you ever had an experience you would consider supernatural or paranormal? Life is pretty supernatural. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Do we really know why we're here, or what you know? What it you know? What is it? it Happen chance? It seems like when I was a kid, I used to I used to love the rain. I used to like. Sometimes I felt transported a little bit just standing in a light rain, not a heavy rain or a storm or anything. <laughs> right. Uh, standing out in that rain was very calming, very sense of fantastic, I mean, kind of a real leveling moments now of that. Now, there, I refer this to acting, too, in a way. When you cease to make things up, now this may be more psychological to you than paranormal, 
but the idea of making when you cease when you empty out get rid of all you know and feel like oh i'm really feel empty it's got but something is always there always there but the fact that you fill up again sometimes it's a lot better or it's you know if that makes sense in yeah. a way that's what i feel to be able to empty out and just be is you know well that's that's true in psychology that's true in other stuff too but it right. but there is something you could say supernatural about that i don't know i agree well, judith uh, just to put a bow on everything here and i will cut yeah. you loose for the evening uh What's on the horizon for you? Is there anything you can share with us? Well, there's a little film coming up, which may be in August. I don't know. That's sort of sitting there. Mm. Uh, I'm assuming I have the script for it. The scenes are nice with the woman, with this woman. And it's not, it's more, it's gentler than most of the stuff I've done. <laughs> so it, it, it may be nice. It's an independent film. That's what that is. Then we see how this other film, this other film we did ourselves and and got a fund me thing with it is, I'll see how that works. Well, Judith, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you it's for a little bit. It's been a pleasure. Bit. You made it very lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, once I get this up, I'll send this to I'll send this to Michael. So maybe we can oh, give it a listen. Oh, that would be great. All right. I would love, so, love that. All right. So no problem. And you have a great rest of your day. You have a great rest of your day, too. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Judith. As always, thanks for listening, and we'll see you back next time. Monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.